If you've released a game with Godot, either 2D or 3D, you may have noticed that when publishing a release build, your players, or maybe you, notice that the game hitches and stutters quite frequently, and then later those hitches go away. And that's because Godot is compiling the shaders of materials that it first sees in the scene tree. So anytime a node with a material associated with it gets added to the scene tree, if Godot has not yet compiled the shader associated with that material, then it needs to do so. And if this happens at runtime, then it's going to freeze your game while it does that compilation. For my commercial game Gunforge, which is releasing in a couple months, you can check out the Steam page in the link below, by the way. I implemented a pre-compilation solution, which basically compiles all of the materials up front. Now, there are a variety of ways you can do this. I'm going to show you the approach that I took, and this is going to be a very high level overview. This is not going to be a programming tutorial. The goal here is going to be to communicate the general strategy that I'm using that you can feel free to adapt to your projects if you think it's useful. So the first thing that needs to happen is you need to set up a basic load game screen. I made this the very first scene that my game loads. So if I run it, what I will see is I will see that screen. And you'll notice that there's hitching that's happening here. And that's because that's where the shader pre-compilation is happening. And then once I'm in the game, it's smooth sailing. So how do you accurately compile all of the materials so that there's no hitching that happens in your game? Before we take a look at the code and figure out how to do that, one thing I should mention is that your load game screen should at least contain some kind of covering. So here I'm using just a black color rect here and then a node 2D in which you can put your materials that you'll be compiling. Doesn't necessarily need to be a node 2D, but you can see here that I've just taken this node 2D and moved it to the center of the screen just to avoid any potential issues where maybe, you know, things are bleeding out along the sides of the screen. That should not happen if you set your color rect to have the full rect anchor preset here. But let's get into the code and let's see how that shader pre-compilation is actually happening. So this is C-sharp code, but I'm going to walk through the code and explain what's happening. It should be easily translatable to GDScript. There's nothing in here that's happening that cannot be achieved in GDScript. I'm actually using a state machine to handle all of my loading states. You don't need to do that. You can definitely accomplish this with just a series of if checks. But let's get right into what the initial state does. So when I enter this state begin, what I do is I create an initial timer of one second. And why do I do this? This is to let Godot start everything up, display the visuals, get the entire tree configured before we start loading it up with materials that need to be compiled. It's just a nice way of making sure that your load screen becomes visible to the player in a way that looks nice before it starts hitching and stuttering as it compiles the materials. After that initial load timer, then we get into the pre-compilation process. So I have a flag here that says if OS is debug build, parse scene paths to compile. And this is one of the critical parts of the solution. So before I go any deeper, let me just explain the high level. What I do is I create a list of all the scenes that contain materials that need to be compiled. Then at runtime, when this load screen is displayed, I parse through that file of scene paths, load every scene at that path, and then recursively look for nodes within that scene that have materials associated with them. Then I take those materials, attach them to a node 2D, and add them to the compile parent node here. This video is sponsored by me. If you want to learn how to build a complete game in the Godot engine using either C Sharp or GD Script, check out the links to my Udemy courses in the description below. So that's the very high level approach. And with that in mind, we can step through exactly how that's looking. So first, if I'm in debug mode, meaning that I'm just running it from the editor, for instance, I call this method parse scene paths to compile. If I step into this, what is this doing? What essentially I'm doing here is I am recursively iterating over all of the scenes in my entire project. So this is what this file system for files in directory does. This is just a helper function that I wrote that again recursively iterates through all the subdirectories of the given directory path. This will then call an action or a function that returns the file path of any files that are found within those directories. And in my case, anything under the scenes directory here is a scene that can be added to the scene tree. All of those files get added to a file list, and then I iterate over each path in that list. 
And what I do is I actually open that file here, and then I read it as text. And then you'll see that I'm doing a regex match here, or a regex, however you want to say it, regular expression. And the regular expression that I'm using is up here in this regex pattern. So this line is how I'm actually identifying which scene files have materials that need to be compiled. You can see that I'm looking for anything that has sub resource or ext resource, and then a type of any one of particle process material, shader material, and material. These are the three material types that I identified, at least for 2D games, that require compilation. I think these might encompass all of the different material types, but I may be mistaken there, so definitely double check that. But I know for sure that particle process materials need to be compiled, shader materials need to be compiled, and regular old materials like canvas item materials need to be compiled. Actually, here's an addendum. I do believe that you want to add the canvas item material here as well. And how I identified these is I just simply opened up the text for various scenes to check how they are actually referencing those materials. So if I search my directory here and I search for sub resource type equals particle, for instance, you can see that I've got a bunch of scenes in here that actually reference particle process materials. So again, that regex is how I'm identifying which scenes contain text that indicates that there is a material in that scene somewhere. If that regex match is successful, I add that file path to an instantiation list so that I can later instantiate that. If you notice that there's some code missing, it's because I actually deleted some. But the next important thing is that now that we have this instantiation list, I'm writing that to a config file. So this precompile config path with mode flags write. And this path is just res resources config precompile list.config. This can be any kind of text file you want, but what this ends up looking like is this. It's just a text file where each line is a scene that has a material. And again, this is determined by that regex that I run against all of the text of the scene files in my game. So if that sounds like a very heavy operation, that's because it is. And the reason why all of that data is being cached in a text file like this is because now all I need to do again is just run that function or that method during debug build. So I just make sure to run this before I release my final version of my build. Then of course, what you'll need to do is go to project export. And for each of your export presets, you're going to want to make sure that you also export that config file with the PCK that is generated by Godot. If you don't, that text file or that config file, however you call it, is not going to be included in your release build and the shader pre-compilation is not going to happen. So you need to ship that list, that pre-compile list, with your game. Okay, so that handles the debug state. So now that we have the list of all the scenes that have materials that need to be pre-compiled, we can now do that operation. So here, again, back in this enter state scan files, again, we did the parse scene pass to compile only if it's a debug build. And then we go ahead and immediately open that precompile config path, this list again. And that is just converted into a list of scene paths to compile. In my case, I'm using a hash set. I don't know exactly why that's happening. It's not important. You just need some kind of list of scene paths. Okay, and then we go into the state compile materials. So this state logic is actually running during the physics process. And again, it's because I'm using a state machine that this looks a little bit wonky. I'm not going to go into the details of how my state machine is working. Just know that this state compile materials is being run every physics frame, which by default is 60 frames per second. And in here, the reason I'm running that in a physics frame is because we actually need to instantiate that list of scenes so that we can pull out the materials. And what I do is I just limit it to instantiating two scenes per physics frame, just because I don't want to entirely lock up the game by just throwing everything at it at once. I want to space it out a little bit. That seems to help in my experience. Maybe you can get away with just loading everything at once in a single frame. I would encourage you to experiment with this. But the entire point of running this in a physics process is to just limit the amount of instantiations that are happening. So at most, I can instantiate 120 scenes per second. Okay, and then I have this method, 
do compile material scene path. In this do compile material here, we're taking the scene path. Again, it's coming from this list here, this precompile list.config. We're loading that, instantiating it as a node because that's what a scene is. Essentially, it's a packed scene which can be instantiated as at least a node. Then I'm checking if the root node of that scene is a GPU particles 2D because GPU particles 2D have particle process materials and those need to be pre-compiled. Otherwise, I'm checking if the root is a node 2D and if it has a material. And if so, that will also need to be compiled. And then you'll notice that I'm calling compile particles node here and compile material node here. I'm going to get into those, but let's see what I do with the descendants here. For that scene, I'm calling a method called get all descendants, and this basically does exactly what it says it does. It's recursively getting a list of all of the descendant children. So I get all the descendants of the scene that I just instantiated, and then I search for all of the descendants of type GPU particles 2D. And again, I call compile particles node, passing in a reference to that GPU particles 2D node. And then I'm doing the same thing down here, except I'm checking for all descendants of type node 2D, where the owner is the scene. So here I'm basically just checking that the node 2D is owned by the node that was instantiated. If you don't know how ownership works in Godot, I'd recommend looking up this owner. As a matter of fact, I could probably make this enhancement to this GPU particles 2D here, but I'm not going to do that right now. I'm basically just saying any descendant who is owned by the scene that I just instantiated up at this level is what I'm filtering by. And also it needs to have a non-null material. That tells me that this child node, or this is rather a descendant node, not necessarily a child, needs to have its material compiled. Okay, so that's a lot there, but hopefully you understand the general approach. The idea is just identify all of the nodes of type GPU particles 2D, compile their particle process materials, and then identify all the nodes of type node 2D where they have a non-null material that identifies a node that needs to have its material pre-compiled as well. Okay, let's go ahead and take a look at the compile material node. Okay, so this first line here, I'm just caching the material paths that have been compiled. So I'm looking at child.material.resource path, and I'm saying, okay, for any resource paths that have already been compiled, I can skip that. So the resource path, you can read the description here. This is either going to point to something in your resources directory. So the file path, in other words, or it's going to be the packed scenes file path followed by a unique identifier. So this is a way that you can determine if you're just compiling the same resource over and over again. I'm just maintaining a hash set again of those resource paths and then skipping the compilation if that resource path is contained. OK, now. In terms of getting the material to compile, it's very straightforward. All I'm doing is creating a sprite 2D. I'm loading just a garbage texture here. You can load your icon, for instance, and then I'm assigning the child material to the sprite 2D's material. I'm not entirely sure if you need to have a texture associated with it. I did this mostly just to be safe because it makes sense that you would need a texture in order for the material to be compiled, but perhaps it's not necessary. You may not need to do that. But that's what I'm doing here. I'm loading a sprite 2D, and then I'm adding that node to the compile parent that I mentioned earlier. So here I've got this compile parent. That's the node that the sprite 2D is being added to. And of course, then I'm adding that materials resource path to that cache list so that if I encounter this resource again or this material again, it's not going to be recompiled. And then in here, I'm just creating a timer of a half a second and then freeing that node that I created, the sprite 2D node, after half a second. So again, this is just, there's nothing special about the number of half a second. I'm just giving the system enough time to compile the material and then free the node afterwards. And a very similar thing is happening down here in the compiled particles node. It's basically the same strategy, except we have to do a couple of different things. So of course, we're referencing now the process material, which is going to be the particles process material. And we have to instantiate a GPU particles 2D instead and set it to emitting and give it a texture. Now, again, I'm not sure if the texture is required. I just think it's probably a good idea to do that. In this case, I'm just using the same texture as the GPU particles 2D node that's coming in. I'm doing all the same caching here. It's very straightforward. If you need to look at this code, feel free to pause the video and take a look at it and doing the same timer countdown here. Okay. 
that's how the actual material compilation is happening. And then there's a couple of counters that I'm keeping track of. So back here, remember this code is running in the physics process. I'm keeping track of the scenes to compile. So the scenes to compile, again, is a hash set that contains all of these items here. Once that is zero, and it will become zero because I'm removing each scene path that I'm compiling from that hash set. You can use a list in GDScript for this, or you can use a dictionary that might be even better. I'm not sure how this exactly would look in GDScript, but basically I'm removing all of the scenes that I need to compile. Once that scene count gets to zero and the compiling materials count is equal to zero, then I can continue on to the game. Now, this is one thing that I didn't mention, this compiling materials count. All I'm doing is anytime I'm about to add that sprite 2D or that GPU particles 2D to the tree, I increment that number, and then after that half second timer, I decrement that number. So I basically want everything to be added to the tree, compiled and freed, and once all of the scenes have been churned through, and once all of the materials have been instantiated and pre-compiled and freed, then I can finish the process. And that is done, I go into this enter state finished here, I give it another half a second of loading. Again, this is just some grace period. Let the engine catch up. Let the loading animation return back to normal so that the player knows that it's done, it's being finalized, and then I can go into the game. So again, I'm gonna run this and show you. So here's the game running, grace period. It gets really choppy while it instantiates everything. It smooths out and then we're into the game. So that's just a very quick visual representation. I'm on a relatively fast computer and the materials have already been pre-compiled. So all that lag that you just saw was just instantiating all of those scenes really. So your end user may end up waiting a little bit longer and it may look like their game hangs for a little bit. I've gotten comments about that. However, that is a tolerable trade-off, I think, to having smooth gameplay from then on out instead of having those hitches happening during the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay. So I hope that really quick overview was helpful to you. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them in the comments below. Again, I'm not claiming that this is a perfect solution. I'm not claiming that this is an ultra-optimized solution. But what I am saying is that this approach makes it very easy to get shader pre-compilation done because... Anytime I add a new scene to the game with a new material, I don't need to worry about manually doing some work to make sure that that gets pre-compiled. Because everything is being scanned with regex, all I have to do is make sure that I run the load game screen at least once in debug mode, and then my pre-compile list will be updated. And you can actually see here, I haven't done this in a while, so I've actually gotten a couple new scenes added to the list, my pre-compile list here. So I'm actually gonna go ahead and publish that after this video, but that makes it really nice, really easy on the developer. I don't need to do any manual effort to ensure that the new materials that I'm making, whether they're particle materials or anything else, I don't need to do any additional work to make sure that they become pre-compiled at runtime. So again, hope that video was helpful. Let me know if you have any questions in the comments. I'm happy to answer them. And once again, if you're interested in Gunforged, I would appreciate it if you check out the link in the description below. I will see you in the next video. Thanks for watching this video. If you'd like to support my work, you can purchase one of my courses, you can wishlist my upcoming game Gunforged on Steam, and you can sign up for my email list at firebelly.com. The links for all of those things are in the description below.